Hi, this is Kent Crow. I'm a retired circuit judge and now a practicing attorney who's been given a chance to share some of my experiences and perhaps a thing or two that your mother didn't tell you. I've been reading about trust. That simple word contains so much meaning that it's impossible to condense what has been written about it into the time that I have here, but I can make some observations that you may or may not agree with. The meaning of the word trust began to vex me when I naively thought it was the key to understanding the surge of animosity and acrimony over the passage of an anti-discrimination ordinance in the little town of Eureka Springs. Eureka Springs is a town of 2,000 people tucked into the hills of the Ozark Mountains in Arkansas. It's known as a tourist destination with an eclectic and diverse citizenship, and it became the site of the first same-sex marriages in this predominantly conservative rural state. The ordinance seemed to divide the community along the lines of those who believed the right for same-sex couples to marriage was a civil right, insured by our Constitution, and those who believed it was forbidden by their religious beliefs. Oh, there were a few people who contended that the Supreme Court had overstepped its bounds and transgressed against the right of states to enact their own laws that defined who and who could not enter into a valid marriage. But the most vocal and most organized opponents were those who assert that ours is a Christian nation and that the fundamental laws of God and nature were under attack. I saw this division as a lack of understanding, as a form of distrust, and that started me on the investigation into this very complicated thing we call trust. We begin to learn trust when we first bond with our mother, and then with other adults who show us kindness and nurture us. That circle widens as we grow older and begins to encompass friends and then a social network that our parents introduce us to. The circle soon expands to include other institutions, such as our schools and our churches, and then perhaps our government. It is in this expansion of trust that we begin to assume our identity as members of a local community, a state, and eventually as a member of a nation. In his book, Trust, A History, Jeffrey Hosking explores all of the ways that the concept of trust has created tribes, communities, societies, and nations. Hosking points out that, as individuals, our circle of contacts with other members of our state and our nation are very, very small. Yet, despite knowing so few of the 300 million people in this country, we believe we all share certain core beliefs, and that generates a certain level of trust. In fact, we project our values and beliefs onto the rest of the state or nation and grow to trust other Americans more than we trust other nationalities. But this isn't the same kind of trust we share with our family and close friends, and it isn't the kind of trust we place in some other relationships. But it is a kind of trust which binds us together as a nation. But do we see all of our relationships the same, or do we trust everyone in the same way? Sociologists and philosophers have different ways of analyzing and distinguishing levels of trust. Hosking tells us that one way of viewing our trust relationships is to consider them strong or weak. We have a strong trust in some people and in some relationships, and we have a weak trust of more routine, cooperative relationships where less is at stake. Think of strong trust as something you have in someone when there is a lot at stake, such as a marriage, such as in your beliefs, your customs, your way of life, or in your religion. Weak trust, on the other hand, is something similar to our belief that the food you buy at the supermarket is fit to eat or that the money you have today will be worth the same tomorrow. Hosking says there is no clear and unambiguous line between the strong and weak trust, but rather a gradation, depending on the risk, the value of resources you commit, and whether the relationship is one that is routine or one that you have considered deeply. For many people, their religion is a matter of strong, deep trust, and it is a very powerful force in some people's lives. For many people, it defines and strengthens a primal trust, which serves as the basis for all of their social life. Hosking says that when religion is most effective, it offers people identity, knowledge of the universe, and a place within it, a path to salvation, an emotional solace and reassurance, and a mutually supportive and trusting community. Yet religion is also a great generator of distrust. 
Think of the distrust between Christians and Jews, between Christianity and Islam, between Catholics and Protestants. I'll talk more about trust, distrust, and my attempt to understand the turmoil that rocked Eureka Springs when it passed the anti-discrimination ordinance next week when we visit more about the things your mother didn't tell you. This is Kent Crow, and my office is located on the Berryville Square. You can call me at 423-7202 or stop by if you have a question about the law. If you want me to answer your questions on this program, post a comment on this website, and thanks for listening to Things Your Mother Didn't Tell You.